Welcome to this conversation. So a couple of things I want to just bring to your notice to begin with. We're starting something called long form or in-depth conversations. We did one with P. Sina about the farm laws and the rollback of the farm laws. Uh, today, we're going to talk about cryptocurrency. Now, the idea with these conversations is to sort of relax on the time. And these conversations are designed for um, our audiences who want to really understand something better. So this is not chasing the headlines but actually taking time out to really understand a particular concept or understand a particular subject better. So um, these are also conversations that will eventually become members only, but we're trying them out right now because everything is a learning curve for us. Why are we talking about cryptocurrency? Now, obviously based on the last estimate that I looked at, apparently India has about 15 million people who are holding assets in cryptocurrency right now. That's a huge number. But the reason why I wanted to do this conversation is because I got a lot of questions asking, what is cryptocurrency? How can I buy it? In the same, you know, in, in the same question, which I thought was really interesting that people want to buy something that they don't fully understand. And I think this has happened because there's so much attention and, uh, you know, interest around it. We saw a lot of these advertisements uh, during the IPL, during the T20 World Cup, uh, in all of the breaks, uh, you know, saying, cryptocurrency made this exchange, that exchange. There is a question of whether or not it is properly regulated. And like any sort of investment, there's always the brag value of people who say that, oh, I put this much money and now I have 6x or 7x or 10x or whatever it is they claim. Uh, as someone who's tracked investments for many, many years, I'll tell you, nobody ever tells you how much money they lost. So you only hear the positive stories. But having said that, we also know the government is currently looking at regulating cryptocurrency. There was talk about a ban, but we have enough reason to know that there's no ban, but there's going to be regulation. So these are the reasons why everybody's asking questions about cryptocurrency. We're going to sort of roll back and figure out what it is and whether it makes sense for us to get involved at all at this point. So to help us understand what cryptocurrency is. I have Ajit Kurana joining us right now. Ajit was kind enough to join us when we talked about the possible ban. And then we had a conversation and he said he's willing to give us, you know, an hour or a little more than that to actually understand the subject as well. So he's been kind enough to join us. Let me give you an introduction. Now, Ajit's name is synonymous with the crypto industry in India. He's the former head of the Blockchain and Cryptocurrency Committee, which is a part of the IAMAI, India's foremost industry body on cryptocurrency. He's an advisor on several crypto projects in the industry right now and is considered an expert on the market mechanism. Uh, the, you know, lots of the, uh, apparently the founders of crypto projects have reached out to him. He's a former head of the BACC as a blockchain cryptocurrency assets council um, you know, in, in India. He was also the CEO of ZPay, which was at that time India's largest cryptocurrency exchange. He took it from it from being a national exchange to being a, a global exchange as well. And like I said, he's currently advising people across the world um, on crypto. So he really, because he's sort of been part of the journey of cryptocurrency in India from the very beginning, it's a great voice to consult with at this point. Ajit, thanks so much for joining us. I appreciate your time. Um, we know the finance minister has now confirmed, and this is our first confirmation, because we've been sort of, you know, groping in the dark for so long. In Parliament, the Finance Minister has confirmed that there will be regulation. She didn't say anything about a ban. She did say that there's no decision right now on banning advertisements and that steps will be taken to create awareness through RBI and SEBI and the government will introduce a bill. So she effectively said the previous bill was chucked out and they worked on a new bill. So um, in terms of regulation, there's obviously a lot to be done and we'll take that step by step. But I want you, I want you to first comment on this uh, this trend we're seeing where people say, what is cryptocurrency? How can I buy it? <laughs> so are you seeing a lot of that as well? About people who don't understand what it is wanting to put their hard-earned money into it? You know, while it sounds silly, right? For somebody to say, what is Bitcoin? I'm just changing that word cryptocurrency to Bitcoin and I want to buy it. <laughs> I, I am embarrassed to say that that was me in the year 2014 and 15, <laughs> right? <laughs> so, so a lot of what we... Eventually, when we become a little more knowledgeable, like look down, up, we have climbed up the same ladder. So I think that what is cryptocurrency is a good question. 
it is a natural evolution of thought it is like i have heard about it so i need to know about it so it's a education oriented one i want to buy it being clubbed along with what is cryptocurrency i think is a little scary because see in every new investment opportunity and i have been an investor uh, actually since a very young age since an age which people would you know find an exaggeration so i don't repeat it but the fact is i have seen plantation schemes in early 90 i have seen mutual funds come beyond the unit trust of india i have seen like so many new i i was there when the controller of capital issue was abolished and sebi came in so i have seen that when something new comes up uh, there will always be a situation where the paradigm is right there's nothing wrong with it but there's a lot of wrong elements in it this could be deliberately wrong where somebody is trying to prey upon the ignorance of the new or it could just be that people just didn't get it you know like we hear of these crazy cryptocurrencies i am sometimes questioned about them which i have never heard which are inconsequential but they become representative of the larger mm. uh, so i think that this question is a good question uh, but they are i would request all people who are watching this to consider them to be two separate questions so once you get the answer of what is cryptocurrency then you may choose to ask how do i buy it so you know uh, a lot of people have asked oh, what is cryptocurrency and if you just do a you know a, a google search on what what is cryptocurrency you will get the textbook answer of it is basically digital currency something 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 i want to set that aside yeah. i want to ask the question slightly differently because let's be honest people are looking at it as an investment right now nobody is actually saying i'm going to pay for my pizza with this cryptocurrency right, right. i want to understand and as, as someone who studied investments there are two kinds of investments right there is the equity there's the debt there's the equity there's the commodities so three kinds of investments so either you invest in something that pays you an interest or a dividend that's how it generates value for you and only things that generate value are considered investments so i i invest my money i either get interest payment out of it or dividend payment out of it or i buy a commodity that goes up in value because it has specific uses gold has a use silver has a use so all of these various commodities have uses if we consider bitcoin or cryptocurrency or any of the other currencies that are available what is its fundamental use case how does it generate value where does it value come from correct if you will allow me say other than debt Please. which is bob lending uh, equity which is ownership and hence may yield ownership like benefits and commodity there is a fourth kind and why i point this out is in the earliest days 2014 to 16 when regulators around the world were first grappling with cryptocurrency they had actually classified it as a fourth kind which is a collectible so a collectible has characteristics like a uh, commodity namely its intrinsic value like i might have a signature of a famous star it may go up or go down so the first classification of cryptocurrency very interestingly and everybody has forgotten it because it's more than 5 years ago was actually as a collectible and this has some bearing on the other question by the way today nobody calls it a collectible the closest mm. we come to is a commodity so uh, this by the way leads to a question which i hope we will discuss in the later part of this conversation as to why is it that so many very intelligent people speak against cryptocurrency because you know those are the people i think uh, their words like i know warren buffett speaks against it uh, you know um, our friend whose name i forget she's the editor with the uh, mint she has authored a book i have met her she speaks against cryptocurrency so these are very respectable and very intelligent people and they make very good points but to now answer your question directly the way cryptocurrency gets created and frankly since there is about 12000 of them they all get created mm. a little differently but i'll try to use bitcoin as a representative example unless it is not representative the way it gets created is as some sort of a reward mechanism so you know the word token is often associated with crypto because indeed in the computer sense it is a token of appreciation for people who are participating in the network some people get it by itself it has no value it has no value like it is not an apple that you can eat and nourish yourself it is not a share of hdfc bank which gives you charge over the profit that hdfc bank might make etc however there are three things that lend it value number one is how it, it was created it was created by a large number of people uh, this is where decentralization and democratization come in contribute to the network and some of them are given this and this action is valued by the community so first is it is like to that extent it is like a collectible that's why i began by saying let's bring the fourth one in. second thing is that this network which is you know called blockchain and i 
you know a lot of people say we'll talk about blockchain later but you can, when you distinguish between cryptocurrency and blockchain you will have two groups because it's indistinguishable this underlying blockchain which is loosely speaking for the non technical people it is like just like the internet is a network the blockchain is also a network right In, internet is a messaging network whether you call it you know a database or email and the blockchain is all a database uh, network the value of this database network has already been proven maharashtra when it moved the covid vaccines was using the blockchain specifically the polygon blockchain and hence there's a polygon token which now is proven to have value right and i could give other examples because this underlying usage of the technology has value there's no doubt about it as in i can give you innumerable examples already not just future possibilities people then say that that which powers it also has value it is like saying that why is petrol so expensive while well, you know the discussion could very well have been about vehicles that use petrol because they are intricately linked with each other because of the fact that if you didn't have these tokens which i think is a good way to look at it what if you didn't have these tokens what would be different in the world how would the world be a less interesting place you would then not have the blockchain and if you didn't have the blockchain then the entire era of decentralization and democratization of technology that is coming in which is you know against these central giants that are emerging on the other hand in technology i think that that cannot be done as in there's no other known technological way today to create a decentralized technology and because that is valuable anything that powers it is valuable so at the heart of it a short answer cryptocurrency is valuable because it powers technology which creates valuable use cases okay so then and you did mention um, i didn't realize there were 12000 different kinds of cryptocurrency i thought there were six about 6 7000 so in that case if the value is in the tech is there room for 12000 Or so are they going to? Are many of them going to sort of fall to the wayside, and there'll be only a few left at the end? Almost all are going to fall by the wayside. There is no reason to have twelve thousand. As in, we have internally, you know, in the industry, debated is the correct number five or five hundred, and that tends to be the range. As in, twenty is a common number, hundred is a common number. What is happening today is, like I said right at the beginning of our conversation, is today if I'm a startup. and i want to raise equity i want to get investors i have to go through a lot of challenges i do even with the froth and excitement and exuberance in the startup market even then it is not easy for a startup to raise money but if i just change the model and instead issue a token right instead of selling you equity i sell you a token it becomes relatively more much much more easy to raise investors money and as a result i think that what we are seeing in these thousands of tokens that are coming up is fundamentally their investors willingness to invest obviously based on their expectation of returns uh, one thing you should know is that 12000 tokens does not mean that there are 12000 underlying technologies like for example i think that most of them probably 6000 plus of them have just one underlying technology called ethereum the number might actually be 8000 for that and you know that's the other question i wanted to ask you so there is there is difference for example bitcoin with the capital b is the actual currency the digital currency we're talking about and then there's the open source tech so a lot of the other currencies actually use the fundamental bitcoin tech uh, or the ethereum tech would you would you explain that to our audience so they understand it better so what i'll do is i'll actually use uh, be a little more uh, technically right for the people who understand it uh, ethereum ethereum was the second major currency today in terms of those 12000 currencies bitcoin alone accounts for 40% of the valuation of the market and ethereum accounts for another 20 so between the two of these 60% is covered let's talk about ethereum when bitcoin became a possibility something which was unthinkable until that point of time because it required a certain development in mathematics uh, so when that happened people said why not take it further and created ethereum as a platform to understand these blockchains such as bitcoin ethereum and there are several other i could name uh, think of it as you know the mobile phone that all of us have we have like android and ios so android and ios is the equivalent of ethereum and bitcoin and the apps that you use on top of android and ios which cannot exist if there were no android and ios or windows or any other such operating system uh, they are built on top of these platforms so for instance when i talked about the maharashtra government using the polygon Uh, blockchain now polygon is actually a scaling solution of ethereum itself polygon mm. is not a blockchain by itself so they created an app which was used uh, for the example that i gave you and there are many other such things it is these apps by the way it is these apps the cars not the road the road is important for the car the car cannot run without a road but it is these cars that are going to revolutionize decentralized finance 
and uh, probably some evolved version of non fungible tokens so if i was coming into this market with 100 bucks in my pocket as the advertisements have told me to do wouldn't i be better off investing in the tech rather than buying the currency so investing in tech is done in two ways one is as a miner again I, i totally hate you know moment back i said non fungible token now i'm saying miner and i'm throwing jargon while i'm an anti jargon person in general but yes i think that if you had uh, the ability to participate in the technology as somebody who is helping the tech grow uh, i think that would probably be a very interesting way in terms of economic output uh, your economic output the randomness of it or the volatility of it actually would be even greater in that case then the volatility you would encounter by investing the 100 rupees because then you are also struggling against the demand supply of other people who are supporting the tech not just the price of the crypto but also people who are participating in the tech but you are right i know a lot of people who prefer to do that some others find it very simple it's actually i'll give you a very simple way to understand so, so it i think why i'm asking this question right and you use the analogy of this is apple or android and then you have all of the apps that sit on that phone right now in a traditional market i will buy apple stock correct or i will buy the google stock that puts the android right there's no way to do that in this market is there so the way to do that is to either uh, go and buy the equivalent of apple here so you are buying ios by buying apple stock right the equivalent would be to get the native token such as bitcoin or ethereum or you could say i love candy crush right and i think that will grow at a pace greater than ios then you will go and invest in the company that made candy crush so both of these opportunities are available here so then let's let's now talk about um, what the government is doing and why they doing it right and if if we consider the other countries that normally have regulations very similar to india um the canada if you consider canada singapore uk for example australia all of these guys have also done similar regulations they done kyc they have licensed the um, the currency exchange the uh, cryptocurrency exchanges and that sort of thing the concerns in india are investor protection because of the sheer number of investors getting in and it becomes the responsibility of sebi and rbi to protect investors um foreign exchange that they're worried about because it allows you to make payments overseas without actually really tracing where that money is going um money laundering tax evasion and the fact that the government has always been concerned about the fact that cryptocurrency will be used in the dark web to buy drugs to you know to fund terror and that sort of thing if we we are clear right now that banning is not going to happen what kind of regulation are you expecting in its place from the government so if you look at most of the common law countries in fact that is what you listed right with canada and england and australia etc while they have all regulated it and allowed it to exist it's very interesting that they have taken fairly different approaches like let us take the case of uh, the us and the us you know it's a state subject as well as a central subject uh, because of the federal nature pretty much like india so i will leave aside the states of new york and hawaii who have very stringent crypto regulations but if i leave those two aside they have used an existent regulation called the money transferers license so a, a giant which probably were, had was worth more than 100 billion dollars called coinbase which is a listing equity in the us actually if you go to their website and see what licenses they have they were money transferers license in all of these states likewise if you go to the european union and so what is what i'm trying to get at is that countries have used their existing regulations and classified crypto into that so in the european union barring crypto specific nations such as estonia and malta uh, if you look at the rest of them they are using the e money license which is digital money license which in india would be the equivalent of a paytm kind of thing and they are applying that canada and australia have taken a very different approach and said that as long as it's your only crypto you don't have regulation you just have registration which means in canada you go to austrac and in canada, sorry in canada you go to fintrac and australia you go to austrac and say hey this is what i am this is what i do for uh, disclosure and kyc so i think that india probably to now specifically answer your question also could look at its existing laws under the rbi act under the sebi act within the sebi act they could look at the cis guidelines etc and say you know what we are just reading those guidelines to now include crypto that might allow us to hit the ground running if we try to create very crypto native regulation it has happened in very very few places around the world including the countries you listed and i think that is a very long journey we will get there someday 
what is your response? And, and let's talk about the people who find cryptocurrency nervous, um, you know, or, or generally uh, something that builds anxiety. What is your response to those people who say that, um, you know, it's likely to be banned, something wrong with it, it's not traceable, the government is not going to be comfortable with it, so you put your money in, it will wind up getting banned, you lose your money. What, what's your response to that? So there are three such people. One is who are very happy with the way things are, and any deviation from it is a problem. So, for example, if you're very happy with the way markets work, banks work, financial systems work, this is definitely a deviation. So they are saying, this is not like what I like, and hence I hate it. So these people I don't respond to simply because I feel that you may love, I may even go so far as to agree that the current financial system is the best that humanity has created ever. But that does not mean it has not to get much better. So that I leave aside. The other part is where people look at the price, the extreme speculative nature of this mm -hmm. asset and the reason that me, people are coming in. So a lot of people who are coming in are not coming in because they support blockchain technology. They're coming in because tomorrow they will 2x their money or maybe their expectations might be greater than that. That actually, I'm in that camp myself. I completely worry about that. I, you know, I don't know if you remember way back when the first mutual fund, private mutual fund post UTI was allowed, it was called Morgan Stanley, which had come up with its issue. People had actually borrowed money against their primary residence and deposited in it because now there was this foreign company, which was going to beat unit trust and, and Morgan Stanley, which was a closed ended mutual fund, hence listed on the stock exchange, remained below par value for the longest time and led to people getting, you know, uh, losing their fortune. I think a similar thing is very likely here. And so I, I'm, I'm, with, I'm very sympathetic to those people and any action that the government does to you know, require a certain type of advertising or require a certain type of disclosure or some funds to be diverted to consumer education as happens with the National Stock Exchange, I welcome all of those. And finally, are those people who are the kind who say that, look, my son who is doing PhD is so much smarter than your son who is doing kindergarten. What I'm trying to point out is people who will take a mature monetary system and as a result, say that anything new that comes, because you'll start as a bud, I will not permit, unless it takes birth as, you know, like a 30 year old, which is never going to happen. I think that when you will say uh, Bitcoin is not traceable, you are comparing it to bank transfers, not to cash. Cash is certainly less traceable than Bitcoin because its ledger is never kept. So what happens is you look at the best option available and you find a flaw with something. I think that that approach is guaranteed to stifle innovation and basically maintain status quo. So that also I would I request people to make, please make fair apple to apple comparisons. See, the other question that came up and I wrote on Twitter, I, said, I asked people, what is it, you know, what, what are your questions about cryptocurrency right now? Somebody said, Do, does the government really understand cryptocurrency? Uh, do, can it really be regulated? And this is a very valid question, right? which we, we've understood that countries across the world have said, we can say we want to regulate, but how much can you regulate really? Uh, and what's your answer to that? How much can it really be regulated? You know, Sushil Modi uh, asked, was talking to a journalist on TV. I, I think it was just yesterday. And he yes. said, you know what? Frankly, I think it should be banned, but I don't think it can be banned. And because yes. it cannot be banned, let's regulate it. It was like, you know, uh, very interesting. Uh, unlike a lot of people who think that government just doesn't get it. At least the people in the uppermost levels who I have talked to, actually, I think they totally get it. Their perspective mm. and motivations might be different than those of, you know, people who are otherwise in the industry. But uh, I think that it can be regulated to a fair extent, which means it can be regulated to the same degree as current financial instruments can be. I'll give you a very simple example, which is something I had proposed to RBI in uh, the period where they had introduced the ban, but it had not yet applied because there was a 90 day period. I said, you know what, if you are so averse to it, why don't we do the exact opposite of the ban? Instead, what you say is that all transactions should begin with a bank and end with a bank. Hence, they create a trace. Any transaction which doesn't begin as well as end with a bank account uh, actually is declared illegal or illegitimate. So to, if you were to do that, I think that you are creating uh, traceability and regulation ability uh, unless you then don't trust the other parts. Like, you know, you don't trust your banks, you don't trust your other things. Then, of course, we have a problem, which is why I said that, let us say there's a certain level of tax evasion in a country, right? If you can bring crypto also to the same general level of tax compliance, I think you've done a good job. To say that in crypto, there might be few people who don't pay tax is like saying in India, there might be few people who don't pay tax. I don't think that's a fair comparison. 
So, I, you know, I do want to ask you this. Um, from what you're reading right now, what kind of investor do you recommend uh, get into these exchanges and start buying crypto? And what kind of returns do you expect? Because it's already, I mean, Bitcoin, for example, has gone from zero to 42 lakh now, uh, you know, in, in, in this time. How much more is it going to go? What do you okay. expect? So really, you asked two questions. First, what the investor? What is very interesting is that the most wildly speculative assets, let's say, uh, let's go to the extreme and make it a gamble, such as buying a lottery ticket. And this is a global example. If you see that the poorest people tend to be the most common buyers of lottery, rich people are not going and buying lottery tickets. So you go to New York State and you look at people scratching those cards they don't seem like extraordinarily affluent people. They usually are the poorest because it is these people who believe that one stroke of luck is going mm -hmm. to change everything. And this, by the way, is, is the gambler's tendency, right? So I would say that because India has chosen, and I believe for the right reasons, to avoid the accredited investor regime, which all other uh, countries do. India, when SEBI came up uh, with its AIF guidelines, it had considered it, but chose to go against it. Uh, they instead chose minimum thresholds. Now in crypto, you can't even do minimum thresholds. You can't say, unless you have so much money, you invest. I think if somehow we could mandate a certain level of education or I'll give you an example, the best new tokens that are created in the world today, the best, the ones where I don't feel they are, you know, frauding or scamming or preying upon people, they actually require you to go through a form which actually has a quiz about that token. Like, what does this token do? What is this token not? So they actually, I'm not kidding, to buy that token, you have to actually go through a form which, unless you had read their information brochure, which would be similar to a prospectus or an easier version of that, you would not be able to answer. If you would not answer it, your Google form or any other form would not be accepted. Hence, you could not even apply. So people have independently come up with this education solution to the education problem. But if somehow we could institutionalize, I think that would be the best. Who would I advise or not? See, here's the thing. I think it's instead of who can invest, I think how much should you invest is the question. Mm. Uh, pretty much like there is like, you know, micro cap stocks as opposed to the blue chip stocks, right? And then there is mutual funds, then there is balanced funds, then there is debt, then there's government debt. So there's shades of gray uh, when, it comes to, uh, when it comes to risk uh, versus return. I think that people should at this point of time assume that this is a very risky asset, right? And given whatever asset allocation they do, you know how you look at your earning and your future potential and your expenses, put a very small portion uh, so you could loosely say anything you are willing to lose. Right. Right? I think that would be a good starting point. Do you think, um, and, and we talked about where the value comes from, but it's also about where, how the government interprets, right? Now, I thought it was interesting that the finance minister said uh, that the RBI and SEBI are going to look at it together. Because technically, if the RBI is looking at it, the RBI is going to look at it as a currency of some sort. Or SEBI would look at it as a commodity or a security. But in your mind, which which of these these two, uh, or you know, what what sort of investment or value is it going to fall into? So I'm going to be speculative here. So what I'm about to say is my guess and not my knowledge. I personally think that RBI's presence would be to make sure that such and such is not happening, while SEBI's presence would be to see such and such is happening. Which means RBI would ensure that it is not being used as payment that it is not being used to remit more value, let's call it money abroad than is currently permitted, that the people who it is licensing are not somehow playing in this regime without a license. So I think RBI is going to say, hey, let's make sure that the bad things are not happening uh, or uh, undesirable by RBI's uh, you know, belief is not happening. SEBI, however, will have to take a more different approach, uh, a different approach such as the, the biggest conduits of cryptocurrency today are exchanges. Uh, in the crypto world, we call these places as on-ramp, where you move from INR to some form of crypto. Are the exchange mechanisms fair? Because, you know, exchanges have good practices all around the world. Uh, I can tell you that most exchanges are using the best practices because their investors often are other global exchanges who are subject to regulation. So by they bring those best practices in. So to the best of my knowledge, most are doing that. Most is not good enough. It has to be all. So SEBI will look at the market practices, capital formation practices, exchange practices, brokerages, disclosures, etc. So I think that SEBI comes in there. And while RBI is clearly about money, SEBI is about a lot of things. Like it's about commodity. It's about collective investment schemes. It's about securities. It's about exchanges. It's about a lot more. 
So if I break this down and we talk about the first thing that you talked about, which is RBI, we'll, we'll, we'll try and make sure that certain things don't happen, right? So, uh, and I'm not even talking about dark web and terror funding and all of those things. I mean, even when the internet came about, there were certain people who said that it'd be used for bad things. And the internet is used for bad things, but it's also used for many, many good things. So if we consider this technology on the same scale, uh, effectively, I could go into an exchange right now, exchange my tax paid or otherwise Indian rupees by cryptocurrency and use that cryptocurrency to make a payment to someone who is in the US or who is in Dubai. Effectively, I have transferred money overseas. Is it possible at all for the RBI to track that, that, that transaction? The answer is yes, if the RBI maintains that exchanges should not allow this or should allow a certain uh, ring fencing or CUG, closed user group, it can do that. However, uh, that is only at the exchange level. The nature of the digital asset, which is where, frankly, I began by saying yes, but the answer is going to soon be no. Uh, that, is, that is the nature of this beast. I have the ability. See, if I hold stock in Larson and Tubro Reliance Industry, where do I hold it? I hold it in one of CDSL or NSDL. Here, yes. I can hold it myself. This yes. asset is like, it's like currency notes to that extent, but I don't need to keep it in a bank or a bank locker. I can hold it in my pocket. Once I hold it in my pocket, RBI reaching me and saying, you can't send it becomes very tough. So uh, that is, that's where you're exactly right. I think that this is why if money started from the bank, so if uh -huh. I started from a bank and bought it in an exchange, then transferred to my personal wallet, and let us say I sent it abroad in contravention of RBI rules, as an example, but you know, because it started from a bank, there's always a trace and you can be questioned, okay, where is this money now? And at hmm. that point of time, if you say, you know what, I sent it abroad, then you've already violated the rule, right? So, but, yeah. But then, Ajit, it also depends on, um, so let's again, let's break this down and make it a little simpler because we could get carried away. So I've taken my money. I've bought cryptocurrency. I have now, I no longer hold it in the exchange. I've moved it into my personal holding with my password, whatever it is. Um, for our audience, it's like it's like how you can have uh, your photographs put in a specific place that are password protected or your documents that are password protected that only you can access. Right? Putting it very, very simply, but I'm simplifying. Now I can use that money to make a payment to someone overseas. Effectively, I've sent money overseas. You know, the RBI has a huge issue with people sending money overseas because you have to pay tax on it. And, and you know, effectively value is leaving our country. If the RBI or if the income tax regulator says, oh, so you bought X cryptocurrency, where is it now? It is still relying on me to be honest about where the money is now. Because there is no way for either the income tax department or the ED or the RBI to trace that special currency that has moved. The currency was specifically designed so that regulators can't trace it. Isn't that correct? So what you can always trace, what you can always trace is the movement from address to address. So for example, if I am the income tax officer and I say, Faye, you bought this, I can see on the blockchain, which is by the way open for everybody to see that you moved it to this address, which I assume is yours. But after that, it has moved further. Can you tell me what that movement is? You know, so the thing is that uh, cryptocurrency uh, is anonymous only to the extent that you may not be able to correlate addresses with people. But you can always know the address, which is why it's called an open ledger technology. So if I can, I can, by the way, I can just, I know all the wallet addresses of all the exchanges as it's known and the government can ask and they can just say, oh, you know, let's see how many people are making multiple hops, which means they have taken it somewhere else and that has gone somewhere else. And they can just say, okay, these people tell us where this is going. So that can be done. They won't know where it has gone, but they'll know it has gone. Yes. And, and effectively, uh, I mean, now I'm really- Hey, you are somehow muted. I'm so sorry. Go ahead. So now I'm pushing you into like, uh, you know, the speculative territory, but effectively there will obviously be a tax um, aspect to this as well. If the government is regulating, it means they will regulate it on a tax service. Would this mean that, okay, so I've put in my money, I have bought crypto. It's only when I sell the crypto and I take it back in, in Indian rupees that there will be a tax instance on it. So that will definitely be a tax instance. But you know, the thing is when you go to any exchange account and let's say I transfer from bank account to exchange, sell in the exchange, convert to INR, which is still in the exchange. This is in my ledger. This is in my exchange yes. ledger. It's like a brokerage account. I'll tell you where the challenge arises what you're saying. Uh, in what you're saying, I buy using INR, I buy Bitcoin. Using Bitcoin, I buy Ethereum. That means there was no INR. This is the question. Some countries have gone ahead and said, 
that you know only when you convert it back to fiat is your uh, is your taxation calculated as in officially they have made that some yes. others have said that at every movement right there is a taxation implication uh, so india will have to take one of those two regimes so effectively you take in 100 rupees to the vegetable market you bought 1 kg of tomatoes because that's all you get for 100 rupees right and then with the tomatoes you exchange the tomatoes for onions and then you exchange the onions for potatoes and you you got some chili it's only when you sell the chili and get you back into indian rupees will you be taxed that's one formula the other formula is to track every one of these transactions which would be a complete nightmare um, and it'll be very interesting to see which route the government does take because we don't know that answer uh, right now but it's going to be interesting uh, to see how that plays out but you know one of the questions that came up and i thought this was really interesting a lot of people said why is it the same currency is at different prices on different exchanges is this simply a factor of exchanges not being regulated how does that work so there is two levels of this one is why is the same currency let's say bitcoin priced differently in india and abroad i think that is a very big question mm-hmm. india has almost always since end 2017 since end 2017 india has always been a premium market so we are 3 5% higher than global rates except when panic sets in so on november 24th when the lok sabha agenda came uh, indian prices were 15 to 18% lower than global prices so first is why is this the answer is very simple capital control norms i don't have the ability as an indian to rapidly bridge this arbitrage opportunity by sending money abroad it's not so easy the question of why is the same cryptocurrency at different prices let's say within india i think that that is a market inefficiency you will typically not notice this in very high volume uh, currencies like bitcoin and ethereum but when you will move down the ladder because there is not enough depth in the order book on the buy and sell side there are these inefficiencies just by the way to do apple to apple even in bombay stock exchange versus national stock exchange when you go to thinly traded stock there are these arbitrage opportunities created but there are really tiny market. arbitrage opportunities and it's really at the bottom it's it's at the tail of the market right yeah, but you know that, no no but bitcoin and ethereum account for 60% unlike uh, the equivalent in a stock market where no two stock account for 60% of the market so what mm. happens here is that if you move beyond the top 20 cryptocurrencies you have already moved beyond 95 to 96% of the market cap so the remaining hundreds account for like 3 4 as in remaining hundreds put together so imagine how much each is worth and by the way these things do set off as in you know it's not at the one place they are always more expensive so it's a market characteristic given that there is not enough volume so you think it's likely that what the government will do is that it will license these exchanges and and demand from the exchanges a certain level of transparency on transactions on kyc on people putting the money in and that sort of thing uh, will there be a shakedown you think of the exchanges that that uh, exist in india i think most of them are compliant uh, and ready to sort of make that switch if necessary again with the disclaimer i keep putting this disclaimer that this is not my knowledge this is my guess but i think that eventually we would have a licensing regime licensing regime has not come in in the best of countries which have been regulating crypto for years if you look mm-hmm. at li- crypto licenses they are available in very few countries so i think that it is not as if any time soon there will be an exchange license available when it is available yes i think that it will be very difficult which is why india does not have india had you know like a bihar patna stock exchange and a delhi stock exchange and a madras stock exchange it doesn't have any of those when the licensing regime came in i expect a similar thing then for now it will be a little more disclosure and best practices oriented one of the major exchanges in india i find that at least the stated processes are in line with the gold standard of the world why is it stated is because there is no audit so to to know whether what is stated is actually being done well i think that would be a great place to start the regulations um you know a concerned primate who's chandru chavla on twitter has said what is the assurance behind this currency how important is it do you think and again the finance minister mentioned that the rbi will do some sort of uh, you know so janhit mein jari education about this because how important is it for people to realize that there is no assurance behind this or is there okay so there is two levels first of all if you say listen is there is this currency backed by gold as currencies used to be till 1970 and since then have not been anywhere in the world so that level of asset backedness does exist in a very very small number of cryptos and that too they are not the major crypto so i'm not naming them right 
but yeah otherwise there is no asset backed nature of this it is based this, on this also there's also Ajit, no sovereign uh, uh, you know backing on it right for example our indian rupee has a signature of the rbi governor saying that he will honor it now we've had one instance in our country when our indian rupees were not honored but setting that aside as a one off uh, but backed the money is backed by the government of india uh, as is most currency all currency from their respective governments this Correct. is an exception so i would just actually i think you have hit the nail upon the head the government that you are trusting to support this in several cases such as in the india case actually is a trustable government because you say you know if rbi and everybody is saying that they value this then leaving aside one incidence of demonetization it is largely valued yes but there are many governments around the world which their own citizens don't trust for example there are 15 countries in the world which while they have their own sovereign currency but commonly us dollar is used as the actual mode of currency in that country mm -hmm. so if you look at it from that point of view what i'm trying to get at it is your belief system you believe the government so you say you know i believe this so the sovereign guarantee there is a set of people who believe that the algorithmic guarantee the, the algorithm called bitcoin that guarantee they rate at actually at par or sufficiently high with the political guarantee of the nation and these people hence say that's good enough for me if you do not think so then you are right also as in it's your opinion as in belief system so you know i get this this sounds really interesting to me because um, many many uh, lifetimes ago i was an insurance reporter in this country and people have a certain feeling it's a feeling it's not even a belief system it's a feeling about government guarantee so lic if you buy lic policy government guarantee hota hai that lic will never run away sbi will never run away you know there's this feeling that the government will pay up it's never going to go past right so the in terms of a belief system the indian belief system in our sovereign guarantee is rock solid and there's actually no reason to doubt it um, because it's never actually it's never failed us as citizens um, but there's also that other and it's a slightly more evolved point of view stemming out of occupy wall street that happened in 2008 when you know big banks and big business um, the americans discovered were running their regulations that their businesses and their regulations and their banking system was tilted towards the rich it was tilted towards the banking sector who were giving themselves salaries and bonuses whereas the actual citizens who were using that money were not being looked after at all and partially one could say that this whole you know cryptocurrency came from that say let's then create a currency that big business cannot manipulate most people in india i think and again this is now my guess most people in india perhaps will not buy into that because we don't feel that way we are very attached to our sovereign uh, you know uh, guarantee right now do you recommend that these people then don't go towards cryptocurrency so i completely agree with our belief in our sovereign in fact you could go to a really bad college and those college will still be saying you know government recognized <laughs> right as if that that proves it as in <laughs> so i understand that Uh, at the same time a uh, lot of people would not buy lic policy simply because of the experience and the process that they would, to do. they would want to buy a private one and people are also in education now going to places that may not be recognized or something but having said that if the reason that you attached to this new paradigm called cryptocurrency was philosophical that you know democratization decentralization kind of thing and at the same time you have this belief in the sovereign then that would be a good reason for you to not buy cryptocurrency right because uh, but at the same time you said that you know more power to the people and barring ai artificial intelligence that it could be debated all technological innovations that i have seen since the early 1990s have all been democratizing in nature you and i are now actually publishing with visual media which only doordarshan or a few licensed channels could do right so it is democratizing we are having this conversation with some people are listening i think that cryptocurrency is also doing likewise having given both sides of the story my recommendation would be that don't be a hardliner on either side as it does not have to be that you know do i believe in this god or that god it is what that's where this conversation goes to it is just that relax a little give everything a chance if you don't believe in it don't buy it don't uh, if you are not sure. how, how how do you give everything a chance without putting money in it yeah so the thing is that if you put money in it put a really tiny amount of money in it like i know several people who so i have in the past helped people turn angel investors this was in startups not related to crypto 
So to that extent, people thought that, hey, you know, this is somebody who knows investments, at least in, uh, let's say, alternative asset classes. And then suddenly when they heard this Ajit guy is now into like Bitcoin, they were like, you know, we used to think he's intelligent. But then when they would talk to me, they would be like polite and say, you know, do you really think I should do this? I said, why don't you try it? You know, a lot of them said, okay, I'll put like 1000 rupees into it and let's see what happens. Mm. So that could be another way of doing it. To put only a small amount of money that you're willing to lose, it's sort of... Uh... I mean, I don't want to say gambling money, but it's basically, it's, it's not your hard-earned life savings. No, 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 no. That's too judgmental. Oh my God, you're stabbing <laughs> me right in the heart. Say, you know, so everybody, however they have earned it, regard it as a hard-earned money in the way they, they I would just say that, uh, you know, like say you're never invested in the stock market, but you're really keen to do so. You could go to an online website and play with artificial money. Like say, let's mm-hmm. assume I bought 100 stocks. That does not do it. You should probably start making small investments. Only then you understand. So think of it as education money. But yes, if that is your approach, then please put like really the 100 rupees that these exchanges are advertising. So, okay, so let me ask you this question. So normally when we talk about stocks, right? So there are the big stocks. There's RIL, there's Infosys. There are these big guys. They've already done their zero to 100. They're, it's unlikely that they're going to do massive, you know, they're, they're going to make you rich overnight like they had done for their initial chaps. But they'll give you a certain steady return. If you want the big bucks, which comes with big risk, you have to go further down that tail and look at medium caps or small caps and take that risk. If we were to map, map the cryptocurrency market the same way, like you kept saying, there is Bitcoin and Ethereum that, that right now corner about 60% of this market. Um, so if I want, you know, if, if you were to say, what are the two coins, uh, the, the two currencies that are not going to disappear overnight, it would probably be these two because they're so big. What is the risk for the rest of the tail? Is it likely that they will disappear? Is it likely they'll take money down with them? So if you go to the far end, what would be the nano, micro, and even small cap of the stock market? If you were to look at that end of it, a lot of these peop- these would disappear and not because somebody ran away with your money, but they could not sustain their technology. Having said that, one thing is very important uh, here to understand is that let's say Reliance Industries, HDFC Bank or the bigger names, you know, who you said have gone to the zero to 10 journey and, you know, or zero to 50 journey. And there's not much, as in, can they become thousand times bigger from where they are now? Quite unlikely because the world does not have that much money. The same logic may not hold true for cryptocurrency. Uh, There is a slight difference. When you say that Reliance or any big stock, let's not name any specific stock, will it revenue grow up 100 to 1000 X from here? I understand why that seems like challenging, but Bitcoin and Ethereum and the big ones are not making revenues right? Mm -hmm. So hence that benchmark actually fails. It is more based on adoption. So there are people in the world who believe that frankly, it is all Bitcoin or max Bitcoin and Ethereum, because at this point, the largest growth in the price or value, I'm correlating both of them, of these large cryptocurrencies is coming from their increased adoption and usage. It is like saying that Android and iOS have really now grown so big. So let me go and invest in that tiny operating system. That won't happen because it's Android and iOS which will keep growing. It won't be that tiny guy. Of course, there could be that one-off. So that, I think, because it's not correlated to revenue, but usage and adoption, I think could still leave enough headroom Hmm. for the big guys. In fact, uh, there's one question from Nikhil uh, Prashar who says, which cryptocurrency is likely to be the next Bitcoin or Ethereum? Right. What's number three? when, When Ethereum came about, and you will notice, uh, Faye, that you and I say Bitcoin the same way, but we are not saying the other one the same way. So I thought I'll just point it out. Uh, so if the e- Ethereum came about, it was supposed to be the Bitcoin killer, right? Mm. Then we found that Ethereum made a space for itself in providing certain programmability uh, co- capabilities and platform capabilities, which Bitcoin was not as strong in its technology. After Ethereum, many many technologies have come which have actually positioned themselves as Ethereum killers. Very interestingly, Ethereum was a Bitcoin killer. None of them have killed Ethereum. And the reason for that is, you know, that you re- every one of us, let's say, you know, HDFC Bank as a stock has given great return over the last decade or even more than that, maybe even one and a half decades. So if I were to invest in a banking stock, it is natural for me to say, you know, should I still invest in HDFC Bank? Or should I now look for the next HDFC bank? So the question is very, very valid, I would say. But having said that, I would uh, also say that if something is the same as something else, then one of them will probably die because one of them will do better than the other. But if something is completely different, it does not have to 
it is not like voldemort and harry potter that only one of them can live, right so it is it is like both of them could live and do their own thing right so i would say that uh, but to answer nikhil's question without dodging it by being so conceptual i would say that eos probably was the first valid ethereum killer it didn't then solana cardano are today seen as potential ethereum killers my bet is they will not although i believe i love both solana and cardano and i think they'll do well in their own way solana for its transaction per second and cardano for its academic rigor the only cryptocurrency which is made by academicians in by writing academic papers etc so they'll all have their own audiences so there uh, is with the ron beasley and hamaini granger and uh, uh, neville longbottom as well that will all continue to survive <laughs> and also dumbledore as in yeah so what i'm saying is dumbledore would be the cardano here um <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know so effectively then um and, and you did talk about how you know how these how they have value how they hold value how uh, you know these different uh, currencies are moving but it seems like for someone like you it might be easier to sort of assess the tech behind uh, the currency and decide that okay this one is a dumbledore this one is more a ron weasley so this is how i think they're going to do but for a regular investor how do we even come close to understanding the intrinsic or the underlying value behind a currency how do i choose i know the names uh, if i pay close attention to someone like you but other than that how do i assess because it's important as an investor to be able to assess right absolutely this is where i believe that if you were to say something similar to the stock, uh, uh, similar in the stock market context you and i would probably have told that retail investor hey go and buy a mutual fund instead right yes. mutual right so i think that in other parts of the world such basket investments if i will call mutual fund a basket investment have already started becoming somewhat popular and i think that regulation will actually pave the way for that to allow for that investor to participate in the economic opportunity without having to look at for example you you might you may be surprised to know that i always keep track of ntv that is nash uh, network transaction value that uh, bitcoin and ethereum are doing i actually follow the graph sometimes multiple times a day because i think that for technology such as paypal money trans western union etc their biggest metric should be the amount of money that they are transferring as a starting point just like in real estate stock you would probably look at the land banks or net asset value yes. so i do that that does not mean that i think it's realistic that everybody will do that but then there are other alternatives go with the equivalent of a mutual fund which does not exist in india regulations are coming in i hope to see such opportunities um you know the observer research foundation has put out a report uh, very interestingly saying and i quote unwise for india to place bans on cryptocurrency when it has the ability to capitalize on the asset um do you expect also that there will be a regulation on what the currencies can charge and there will be a tax on what the currency is charged so there can be a gst then on that charge as well which means that actually doing these transactions might become more expensive once the government steps in so very interestingly if you were to look at how fund raises are done by new coins because that is the area you going into uh, globally what it is being seen as this might come as a big surprise to you is that it is being seen as a sale so if i issue my stock to you and you give me money that's an investment i yeah. as a issuer of equity have not accrued profit at this stage but if your token is an asset and not a security if i issue it to you i have actually sold you that which means at the investment stage itself it has become it has accrued some profit if i could say that my cost of production of the security or token was so much the rest of it is all profit so you are right those sort of uh, you know instances do come up very interestingly if you will i have really you know been glued to my my various platforms to see what is being said by whom nobody has really focused on the issue of new tokens right mm. uh, by the you will notice that your question is always currencies i answer with asset and token because we as an industry have started staying away from that word because that gets many people very excited that currency word so we are now saying crypto assets we are okay. saying you know tokens we are but anyway you are most welcome to continue saying that having said that i think that yes you are right on both accounts that nation will do well in the crypto business which is the same nation as did well in the information technology business because fundamentally it's all it if it also has a good financial infrastructure and is also english speaking i think it will do the best and india is perfect so i think india is standing at a threshold of that and on the second bit where you said that issuing of tokens might start attracting a very different uh, 
uh, you know, sort of regulation. I think you're right there too. Uh, so far, it seems that the current regulation may not be discussing that too much, or maybe it will be in there when the final regulation comes, but nobody has talked about it yet. So, you know, the other thing I must, because uh, you now that you're saying tokens, and we'll also try and like figure it out. So effectively, you're saying instead of, it's not like you're going out and buying dollars, which is a currency, you're going out and buying pieces of art that you say are going to increase in value because there's a certain limited number of them available in the market. You're buying collectibles. Uh, there is this other new idea of NFTs, which is uh, actual art on, in, on the internet that is being sold. And it comes up every time crypto is being talked about. Would you be able to explain to us the link between these two things and how they're different? So the link between them is how they travel technologically. So suppose I have a non-fungible token, which might be, let's just call it an MF Hussain painting, mm. which exists. If I want to give it to you, if I had a scanned copy of that, I would send it to you on WhatsApp or an email as an example. But it is not just that I want to display it to you. I want to transfer ownership to you. So just by attaching it to an email and giving it to you has done nothing. You can just see it because the original is still with me. What is happening by transacting these let's call it digital art for now, although I think that's a very narrow definition of NFT, but this digital art is that along with the art can go the right of ownership. It is pretty much like we can all see the picture of Mona Lisa. You can go to Google images and say Mona Lisa and you'll find 100 versions of it. But that does not mean that the value of actually owning the Mona Lisa or its officially licensed digital version, also it's not that that value is zero. So that is what is happening here. And because fundamentally, what is so great about blockchain? What is so great about blockchain that even Reserve Bank of India is considering a central bank digital currency is that it transfers peer to peer, pretty much like the example of the photograph that you gave. And I think that that is why NFTs or digital art have taken so well to the blockchain because transferring it from me to you uh, is being done far more efficiently. And I could also transfer some other usage or ownership rights along with it, which was not possible until now, other than through contracts. So it is also possible right now to, to sell or buy an NFT using normal currency. You know. 100%. Yeah. But Absolutely. you're just, you're saying using crypto will just make it more efficient. I think that the second step after the buying is where the difference comes in. For example, one of the world's largest NFT platforms and the earliest success story is called NBA Top Shots. NBA is the National Basketball Association of the US, which took clips of various you know, basketball games. It called it moments and you can buy those moments. But the interesting thing is that you can't take it away. And so I go to nbatopshots.com, buy the moment and then send it to you. I can't, I have to give it back to the platform. So mm -hmm. this, does not require the use of NFTs at all. Like Lysis, Christie's and Sotheby's have been selling, selling digital art even in the past when it was not uh, an NFT. The difference is that making it a token, putting it on the blockchain allows for the secondary level transactions to happen. Furthermore, keep in mind that if an NFT is created, you can program into the NFT that every time it changes hands, 10% or any percentage that you program, 10% of the sale price should automatically accrue to the owner or the seller or the creator. Yeah, this yeah. will be done programmatically. There'll be no action taken. So because of the programmable nature of such transactions and that I can do it from wallet to wallet, it is definitely a step further than, you know, if you were to merely, okay, the difference between a digital wallet, payment wallet, like a Paytm, Mobiquick, et cetera, and a digital bank account where you can see what you have, you can't do anything with it. I think that is the big jump that you can get with making art into NFTs. So if the government of India decides uh, that cryptocurrency cannot be used as legal tender, then effectively I cannot buy NFTs with cryptocurrency in India. Is that correct? So first understand that only one country in the world, which is El Salvador, has accepted cryptocurrency as legal tender. As Japan has said that it accepts it similar to, as in some people think Japan has made it legal tender, which is an exaggeration because legal tender is, you know, coinage act and so many things have to be changed. I think that if you classify NFT as a token, if you classify NFT as a token, then it's a token like Bitcoin and Ethereum, right? So I could, actually, I think I'll just take one step back. It can't be used as a payment system. So I use my INR, buy Bitcoin. Now with this Bitcoin, can I buy Ethereum? 
Has that made this Bitcoin a payment system? Does it mean that I have to now withdraw INR and then send INR back and then convert it? The view that has been taken by countries who do not accept it as part of their payment system is that token to token transfer is not seen as a payment system. Hmm. Right. So to that extent, using cryptocurrency to buy NFT is, uh, is not using it as a payment system. Charging your Airtel mobile with Bitcoin would be a payment system. All right, uh, Ajit. Thank you so much for spending time with us. I have a, I have a feeling we'll have a lot more questions to answer, and I'd love to do this conversation some more because it's a fascinating subject. We're all still sort of unpacking uh, what you're telling us, and it's going to take some time. Uh, Ajit Krara, thank you so much for our audience. Uh, Two things, leave us feedback on these long form sort of in-depth conversations. If this is something that works for you, that'll be great. Um, also give us questions uh, if you want us to take it up and uh, we'll convince Ajit to come back. Thanks Ajit, thank you so much. Thank yes. You. Thank you. Yeah, but my, my point was that if when you publish this on YouTube, your users leave questions at the end of the video, I promise to come into the comments and answer them. So awesome. remain interactive. I'll be there. <laughs> awesome. I'm really pleased to hear that. Thanks so much. It's been such a pleasure to chat with you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.